The United Nations has donated ventilators and other essential medical equipment to Nigeria to help in the fight against coronavirus pandemic. The UN Resident Coordinator to Nigeria, Edward Callan, made the presentation to members of the Presidential Task Force on COVID-19 at Namdi Azikiwe International Airport. Mr. Callan says the equipment which was procured through the COVID-19 basket funds recently launched by the UN will help boost government efforts in providing efficient health care for infected persons. On behalf of the UN system in Nigeria, I want to officially hand over these medical supplies that have been procured by our system to support your efforts in fighting the COVID-19 pandemic in Nigeria. This is a trying moment for all of us. We are witnessing today our humanity under threat by, the, by, by COVID-19. Nigeria has always demonstrated that they can live to this expectation. The work that was done by Nigeria during the Ebola crisis was a commendable one. So we are looking forward to the authorities to do a similar job in trying to contain the, this COVID-19 pandemic in Nigeria. And I'm sure Nigeria will be able to rise up to this expectation. Whether you are from the east or from the west or from the south or from the north, it is humanity that binds us together. And it is that humanity that you have demonstrated today. We thank you very much for this gesture. And we will do everything possible to use this to assist our people, particularly those that have been positive for this uh, COVID-19. And. Um, Rest assured that uh, the supplies given to us this day will be utilized to the maximum benefit of our people. On behalf of the task force COVID-19, we accept this kindness from the UN system and we assure them it's going to be utilized for the betterment of our people in this country. And in particular also the other support uh, um, agencies that we are grateful to as well including the airline, Allied Air Cargo, who volunteered to ship this uh, consignment from Lagos into Abuja at a very, very short notice. We are now being joined via Skype by Obi Ezekwesili, who is the former presidential candidate of the Allied Congress Party of Nigeria and also co-convener of Bring Back Our Girls. Good morning. Good morning. And good to have you this morning. Pleasure. And let's talk about, you know, all that we are doing, our leaders are doing in terms of responding to the COVID-19 pandemic. How do you react? Do you think we are doing enough? Um, you know, it's a um, very composite kind of response that you need when you have a health crisis that is a pandemic. Because with the health crisis comes multiple other crises, such as uh, the economic crisis, as well as social uh, tension and crisis. And you have to manage all of these because the combination of health pandemic, economic crisis, social tension could lead to destabilization. And therefore, it becomes also an insecurity uh, 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 problem, a, a high risk of insecurity. So if you looked at it from that perspective, then you would have to break it down into the various sectors that are affected by the pandemic and then look at the um, overall strategy of the government and make an assessment of it. From, my, from where I sit, I think I have um, very, uh, uh, I would say, fair confidence in the technical team at the NCDC, that is the Nigeria Center for Disease Control. Um, it is being um, led by someone who surely has a good profile in disease control work. He's a scientist that is well recognized globally. So he's assembled a strong team. My challenge is the political arena within which he has to uh, excel as a, a technician, as a technocrat that I, I do hope that in everything that he does, um, they understand that you've got to minimize politics 
in when you're responding to health crisis. Um, I saw that yesterday he showed that they would amplify or that they would increase the number of testings that happen. This is the kind of pandemic that you need rapid response in terms of detecting, testing, uh, taking people into care, and then doing a, con a contact tracing. And all of these would require that the political structures and systems align themselves to support that process. Um, then when you look uh, in terms of the, uh, the, 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 the phase that we, we're getting into, uh, in the, uh, vi the, the virus life cycle, you would, you would want to say, God, don't help, don't make us get into community phase or where the community infection uh, begins to accelerate. God forbid that because prevention is better than cure okay. for societies where the health systems are very weak and vulnerable. And you know that we fall in that category. Um, so technically, I am praying to God that all the work that Ihekwazu, Dr. Ihekwazu, uh, uh, Dr. Chiko Ihekwazu and his team are doing would be able to sustain us to the point where we can avoid this very terrible and cataclysmic phase of community infection. The other part of it then is because some of the things that you must do in order to uh, prevent the spread of the virus, would require shutting people in, getting people to do safe distancing, getting people to practice personal hygiene protocols. Um, the, the aspect of lockdown to shut people in has consequences uh, financially uh, for people. In an economy where more than 70% of the people depend on income they generate on a daily, daily basis, any lockdown of their mobility means that the implications are dire. And I think we're beginning to see manifestations of that. So in terms of the economic response to the economic necessities uh, that create a tension between compliance with the protocol for reducing and uh, eliminate or reducing significantly spread of the virus, um, it's tough because Nigeria entered into this crisis already in a very vulnerable fiscal position. Our public finance is, um, is, it has been wobbly uh, for, for, for quite a while now. Uh, we have had to uh, suffer the effect of the pandemic globally in the impact it had on oil price. And oil price determines to a large extent our public budget. We have no room for maneuver. So whereas other countries are able to buy compliance from their citizens because they have some financial incentive that would make people stay at home and not have to force themselves out there to be able to earn a living, those countries have done better. So we are in a catch-22 situation. Damned if you do, damned if you don't. But when you are faced with those kinds of um, di dilemma situations, you've got to look at how to lessen the worst case scenarios that you're faced with. And I have uh, maintained that one thing that uh, could happen is a better coordination and collaboration between the federal and the states so that you can pu put, pull together a basket of resources and coordinate in a way that enables you gain more efficiency in the amount of money that you can use to buy compliance by really targeting the poor and the vulnerable that cannot sustain themselves in the next couple of weeks. All right, Ma, still if, if I may interject you, sorry about that. Uh, but we are seeing in some quarters the beginning of state initiative. Again, I ask, is this a good thing, in your opinion, to be able to curtail the spread of this pandemic? It is a good thing, but as you know, um, if you took even the federal government intervention where it is saying that it is trying to reach the poor and vulnerable, there were some 2.6 million that they said were on their register uh, for the social investment fund in the past. They are now amplifying and therefore they are increasing it to about 3.6. If you looked at 3.6 million in relation to the uh, 
and tens and tens and of millions of people who fall in the category of poor and vulnerable, you would see that it's just a droplet. Now, what the states are doing are very important and complementary. But when you look at the two major points of vulnerability for us, as far as this disease is, con this uh, virus is concerned, Lagos and the FCT, you can see already the steering of dissatisfaction on the part of the people. So it means that for us to be able to do this, we need to sort of use the National Economic Council, which the vice president chairs, to discuss this as a, a comprehensive kind of economic response approach to this. In the short term, we need to pool the resources in the way that the places where we have greater vulnerability, we can push more resources there to target those who are restive and restless. They want to come out. They are coming out, we we'll put they, them, as well as the rest of us, in a situation of vulnerability. And that I am not yet seeing tightened up well. Mm -hmm. I know that people are also reaching out. You are in communication with a lot of people. Uh, those who reach out to you, uh, it, does it, are they suggesting that they are not getting enough help or they're not getting what they need during this time? What do you hear the people say? Oh, well, you know, I mean, you also know that um, I, I am a pastor's wife uh, in the Redeemed Christian Church of God. So we've got congregation that fall within this, um, this um, uh, category of Nigerians that really need this kind of support. It's almost in, in a situation where you cut off a means of livelihood from people who are almost subsistence in their, uh, in their, in their living standard. You must have someone who steps in. So in the case of the Redeemed Christian Church of God, where the church is stepping in vigorously at a family level, just like many families that I also know, we are stepping in to support that process. It's about social safety net. Mm -hmm. Now, what we see clearly is that poor governance has caught up with us. Mm -hmm. if, we were, if we had good governance, by now we would actually know how to find the ones who need state support and find them in, a, in an efficient way. Now, I, I finding them is even harder. Knowing who needs support of a particular scale or the other is harder because just the basic idea of knowing who we are, the identification of the income status of Nigerians at the press of a button is difficult for us. Other countries can find their poor and their weak, their vulnerable uh, very easily. And so they can target better we're having a problem of targeting. And, and, and that means that we're, ex we're going to even exclude so many more people that we could have reached. Talking about the poor and vulnerable, uh, yesterday was the sixth year of uh, the, the sixth year of uh, the Chibo girls, uh, those who were kidnapped, and it was marked uh, yesterday. And over the weekend, there was prayers of Thanksgiving, also, you know, that uh, was held. And the president uh, sent his word to them and saying that uh, some government government officials are not able to attend, but he is promising that uh, the Chibo girls are not forgotten. Are you worried particularly about the during this time that we seem not to hear anything or know what is happening with them in the sixth year of their kidnap? Well, the words of the president completely detract from his actions. So as far as we're concerned, they are very hollow words. They mean nothing. They don't assure anybody. What would assure us is that the president would pick up his phone and actually give the comfort directly to the parents of the remaining 112 Chiba girls and uh, Leah Sharibu, uh, who was from the Dachi school. Um, if the president wants to be believed, uh, what the president and his government would do is to present to the public where in real terms uh, the, 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 um, uh, the uh, rescue strategy of the government is. We're not saying divulge things that are sensitive, but at least there is a level of communication of action or measures being taken that would persuade any reasonable person. And we're truly reasonable people. Um, so for me, I think that my worry about Chibo girls is that the government seems to think it's an endless tragedy. And that whenever, you know, you can just carry on for as long as possible. These are people's children. Six years was enough time for those girls to have graduated, gone to university, and then begun to work mm -hmm. after their youth service. So for me, this is too tepid 
a reaction from a government that has seriously failed these young women who have now been forced to, to, to see that they, they, they only had two choices, either agree to be educated or agree to be safe. So by agreeing to be educated, they risk their lives. As Should we leader, have such a society? I beg to cut in again. I beg to cut in again. As a leader of the BBOG, if the president is watching and those who are directly involved, what would you be asking them to do practically during this time? Well, during this time, they already had a, a something that they did in the past. You remember that we have 107 girls back. I don't need to suggest any options to them. We already had looked at the options that were available and done a risk assessment of each of them and then said that the government always is the entity that has superior information. If you want to make a decision about something, you must go to the person with superior information. If you are looking to me to give information, you would have what we call asymmetry of information because I am not the source that information can come to. So he knows what best information is available on the basis of which to choose what option worked in, in the previous times. And uh, uh, 107 Chibok girls, uh, 112 Chibok girls, uh, as well as Blair Charibu and other citizens need to uh, get their freedom. And finally, uh, the point that is to be made is that if the government would communicate about cheaper girls. They would give the families some sense of closure of one kind or the other. A closure that says, we, this is the much that we can do. Then the parents can get to the point where they quickly adapt to that kind of news. But don't leave them totally without any information. That is very, very wicked. I don't suggest that they continue to do that to those poor uh, families. Or to say to them, you know what? Give us maybe six more months, give us one year. And when we come to that point, we can then say to you, this is the most that we were able to do. Mm -hmm. That would be a good way to show that empathy underpins good governance. Finally, before I let you go, there are people, Nigerians, some Nigerians, who would say the choice is between dying of COVID-19 and of starvation. How do you respond to this? Yeah, that, you know, it was what I was saying about the tension. There is a tension between compliance with the lockdown and the survival on the basis of income to assuage hunger. But it doesn't have to be either or. We need to convey the message in a way that even these are citizens understand that, you know, you have to be, you have to be alive in order to be hungry. If you're, if you're sequencing this, a person must be alive in order to be hungry. So that what we need to do more is to figure out how neighbors can be neighbors again. When we pool our resources as communities, we can do better. Nobody would go without. We're, we're being called back to becoming community. We're being called back to becoming our brothers, our sisters, keepers. So not, not just thinking because government is not doing it. Therefore, we should leave these people to face death. Death by hunger is a possibility. But worse is death by a deadly virus. And we all can work together to ensure that we don't lose one more person that shouldn't be lost to this pandemic gotten some uh, financial intervention as you heard in the news from EU and uh, Serap amongst others are asking you know that we we'll be able to see how this money is are spent uh, uh, should you expect that we'll see another level of transparency a deeper level of transparency and accountability to give Nigerians assurance that yes this is well spent and directed to the right persons and right quarters Interestingly, only yesterday I was reading a piece of uh, news out of South Korea, which was saying that South Korea has been one of the very effective countries in the containment of uh, 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 the uh, C-19, that is COVID-19, and that a major part of it has been because of the accountability that the government has had to citizens. And I just, you know, I just felt so good reading that. Because when we talk about the need for government to accept that democratic culture requires accountability of those that govern to their citizens, they sort of make it appear as if, oh, you hate government, you don't like us. That's why you're saying that. 
that accountability and transparency is a major antidote to this problem. We can check this problem by ensuring that everything that the government is doing, it is communicating, communicating, communicating. It is opening its book. It is telling us as much as possible. The daily briefings are good, but I would hate to, for them to become things that are just, uh, what, do you, what do you call those things? So just let's fulfill righteousness. This substance of what is being communicated is critical in order to help citizens make the right kinds of judgment at any point in time. Coming to the matter of the, uh, uh, you know, the partners that are providing resources, frankly speaking, no matter how much the government has gotten from private sector and groups like the EU, they pale in, 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 in comparison to the government's own resources going into this fight. It would be helpful for the government to occasionally take days and to show what kind of resources it has put into the different interventions that have been necessary to contain the spread of C-19. Thank you so very much, Obi Ezekwesili, for your time this morning with us here on Plus TV Africa. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. And stay safe. And stay with me in the studio is Annie Uvi Ayeni to stay further have a conversation on this. Good morning. Good morning. I mean, you heard that very fierce uh, yeah. conversation. Um, first of all, let's look at what she said about indeed um, there is hunger and then there is need to also pay attention to COVID-19. How do we put that in balance, realistically speaking? In reality, just like she said, we need now to be our brother's keeper. We look so much at what the government, federal government, state governors are doing. We're not looking at what the local government representatives are doing. These guys went through a campaign. They went to every single crook and cranny of their environment just to get elected. Now it's time for us to see them, to see, let them have a face. Let's see what they are doing. Let's see the community support that they are giving to their immediate environment. Some of them live not too far away from some of these people who complain every day. I don't know where they all live, but some of them live not too far away from these people who complain every day. Every single environment in Nigeria, we have a church or we have a mosque mm -hmm. or we have some form of community place where people can meet. In those, those local uh, government representatives can make soup kitchens. Soup kitchens where I'm sure women will be happy to volunteer mm -hmm. from churches, from mosques. I'll go there, I'll cook morning. I'll go there, I'll cook evening. I'll give people food so that they know that, yes, there is a response. That is a part of being our brother, our sister's keeper, mm -hmm. which means that dying of hunger is terrible, but more the disease because the disease is apparently undefined at the moment and needs to be contained. We are now in the second line of the uh, lockdown and we are seeing increasing cases of insecurity you know uh, people are already reacting how do we come to a place where uh, we don't get into the danger as it is already of you know becoming unsafe because we want to avoid COVID-19 what can be done you know in the face of these security challenges Unfortunately, unfortunately, in, in a broken system, we find this type of things. And a lot has already been said about how broken or how what government did and what they, they did not do. And just like we go back to also the fact of the community responsibility, it is now our own individual responsibilities. When we were growing up, we had Boy Scouts, we had Girl Guides, we had rules by which we lived by, we had ethics by which we lived by. These are the times to sensitize the environment that you come back to who you are, get back to who you are. Now, some of these youth, they are restless because there is nothing for them to do. Mm -hmm. And they feel this is something I can do and get away with it because there is nobody watching. But there is somebody watching. It's going to be a bigger, a bigger call to duty on our security system that is already st being stretched enough as it is. It's time to get back to the communities. Let Put responsibility on the pastors. Put responsibility on the imams. What is your responsibility to the community? Mm -hmm. If they can speak to some of these young people, because young people know how they, they know their language, yeah. there are youth pastors, there are Islamic leaders who teach, and get, get the responsibility to them. Speak to your boys, speak to your girls. Mm -hmm. The Nigerian Union of Road Transport Workers, they have leaders 
amongst all these touts that follow the bosses. They have leaders amongst them. Get back to them. You speak to your boys. Mm -hmm. Go, go, um, put your boys under control. What is their problem? They, are, they cannot do this. They cannot do that. What in the community can they do? I think it's time we get back to the community and get back to individual responsibility of those people who have leadership when it matters. Mm -hmm. All right, lastly, um, before I let you go, does this suggest that we have a bigger problem with this escalation that we are seeing? Does this suggest that we have a bigger problem in the society? We do have a bigger problem in the society, which does not need to be a bad problem if we handle it and contain it properly. Yes, people will get angry. Yes, people are aggravated. Yes, people are getting hungry. What is our response to it? If they can see that we have a response to this, then people can feel encouraged. People can feel strengthened. People can feel at ease to know that, yes, we are dealing with this together. I think the more information we give people about the reality of the importance of having self-discipline is the more it will help us to be able to get on top of this rather than under it. Thank you so very much, Thank Annie, you. for your thoughts there.